Hey everybody, it's Troy. Uh, I'm getting ready to do this video to help you guys understand a little bit about the um, designing the virtualization. Um, so, I've got my diagramming tool open and I am going to start dragging shapes out in, onto the screen so that you guys kind of see what I'm talking about. Um, I'm going to pause the video while I do that though so that you don't have to sit here and stare at this while I try to do all this. Uh, so, um, I will uh, you know, be right back. Of course, you won't see any difference anyway. All right, so we've got our shapes on here now. Uh, and these, you can use any shape you want. I just grabbed a couple of miscellaneous shapes. This is a tower. This would be like a tower um, uh, server, and this is a this is they call it a host, and it's just a rectangle that somebody drew. So um, it doesn't matter; just something that represents what you're doing. So um, the key is to use the correct terminology. So for this one, we'll write uh, host one. And this one we'll label host two. So now you're going to have to decide what you want to do with these, okay? So when I say host one and host two, these are two separate physical machines. And they're going to be the hosts for uh, all of our client or guests uh, machines. All of the um, different servers and stuff that we're going to have. So host one, let's put down uh, our specs. We have to we have to we have to spec each of these out. So let's say that host one's going to be a little bit smaller server than host two. All right. So with host one, we'll put CPU, and we'll put uh, one, and we'll put that it's a twenty core. Then we'll say that uh, as far as RAM goes, it's going to have, um, oh, jeez, I don't know. Um, oh, let's see, 156 gigabytes. storage we'll give it um, say that we have uh, we'll say we have four bays okay and each bay will have uh, four terabyte car or four terabyte um, hard drive in it so we have 16 terabytes total. Okay. And then over here with this machine, um, we'll do the same thing. All right. So, <clears throat> like I was saying, we're gonna we've got them named. We have our uh, uh, our our spec amounts. Let's spec host two. This one's gonna be bigger. So for this one, we're gonna have C CPU one. And it's going to be, uh, let's go um, 40 cores. CPU 2, whoops. It'll be 40 cores as well. It's ideally... Um, I mean, this isn't something you guys actually have to do on this assignment, uh, but just for future reference, know that it's it's always a really good idea to match the cores inside your machine, especially a server. It's it's gonna fix a lot of problems that that you may end up having. 
um, just because it's uh, it's it's just a better there, there's a whole bunch of different reasons technical reasons um, but it should they should be the same core um, that's what'll make make like easier for you okay so on this one the RAM and I you know I, I'm just throwing out numbers here so I don't know um, exactly the what the RAM's going to end up being. You know, it's always a little bit more or less than this is. But this one's going to be bigger, and we're going to have to have um, RAM for core for for CPU one and RAM for CPU two, okay? Because they operate separately. So RAM for CPU one, we're going to say is going to be. Uh, let's say it's, uh, 128, okay? Oops. Now, what's going to determine how much RAM you have is the motherboard. So the motherboard will have, um, what they call channels, okay? And those channels for each CPU they actually have to you have to have them in you have to have the ram placed in the correct order for it to recognize all the ram that you're trying to use and for the ram to even work so if you ever if you look at a server um like a rack server you pull it out take the lid off you look underneath it it will tell you which channels go together and they're not necessarily in a linear order. You might have, you know, channels 1, 2, and 6. I mean, it's, it could be really strange. You just have to open it up and look at it, okay? And this is where this one's going to shine. Because we're going to say storage on this one. We're going to say that we have um, 8 bays. And uh, it's going to have, whoops, I don't know, I'm, I'm making a mess of this, you guess. All right, eight bays, and we're going to put um, uh, eight terabytes in each one. These are, remember, these are hard drives. And they don't, I mean, they don't have to be the traditional hard drive. These could be... Uh, uh, these could be solid states. It, it doesn't matter. Whatever you want to do, um, that's up to you. Do it however you want to do it. Uh, solid states are becoming more and more popular in uh, um, uh, more and more popular inside um, uh, servers, uh, and so are the uh, the uh, uh, NVMe to PCIe. Um, we put some of those into a server where I worked and just as additional storage, it didn't become, uh, necessarily part of the raid, uh, but it, it became additional storage for us. Okay. So now we have host one, host two, and we spec'd it out. All right. So remember when your hypervisor sees this, a hypervisor is just going to use the big number. All right. So for host one, your hypervisor is going to see 40 virtual cores. Because if you remember, there's, it, it, it virtualizes the cores, so there's, it doubles them. So you have 40 virtualized cores. You'll have 156 gigs of RAM. And then your storage, you'll have 16 terabytes. Now, it won't be exactly 16, as you guys know. And the, gig, the RAM won't be exactly 156. Now over here, it's a different, it's a, it's a little bit different, okay? So over here, um, I'm going to put actual or whatever word you wanted to use to, to tell me that this is what the host is seeing. Over here, the host is seeing 160 virtual cores. <clears throat> because it doesn't view the two cores 
separately. It aggregates them so that it gives you a total usable number. That way you don't have to pick which core the host is going to use for which machine. It divvies everything out equally so that it, it processes and runs efficiently. I hope that, that makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, let me know. And I'll, I'll try to confuse you another way. Then it'll still see the... Um, uh, and now it's going to see 256 gigabytes of RAM. All right? That's because... Um, we didn't finish this here. Hold on. We're going to give this... Okay. Anyway, uh, oh, come on. This is the only thing I don't like about this program. So, I should have done this in, in the right order, but. Right, there we go. So, same with the RAM as with the CPU. It sees it just sees an aggregated total. It gives you it gives you an aggregated total. All right. So, you have 256 on these two machines or on these with this these two cores. <clears throat> now, interestingly enough, there's a way depending on your hypervisor and things like that, that we can create a cluster with these two machines. And we did this, I've, I'm used to, to VMware ESXi, and some people are used to other stuff, but anyway, there's a way we can create a cluster between these two machines. And it helps us in, in different ways. Um, but it one of the things that we'll do is on your dashboard that you use to monitor and make changes and stuff, it will show over here, or uh, it actually will show you that you have, um, let's see, 200. virtual cores and that you have um, let's see 256 what's that 412 my math is wrong forgive me 412 gigabytes of RAM and that you have uh, 80 terabytes of storage. Actually, let's see. Um, yeah, that's right. So, what it does is when you look at it, you'll see um, you'll see like a uh, let's make a quick line here. You'll see like a line, um, and this line might be for RAM. And then um, above it, it will show you, it'll, it will fill this in with color, and it will say, um, Say, might say 50% available. Okay.
So when you see this on the very first screen or whatever screen it is on the on the tool you're using, this is this is showing you an aggregated total. 50% of this 412 gigabytes are left. Now you can click on each individual host and it will give you the exact same information but just for this host. Okay? So I'm just giving you an idea of how all this works. So now that we have this spec'd out, there's a few things that we're going to want to think about when we're doing. So um, we're going to uh, list over here some of the servers that we know we have to have. Okay? Now, I'm designing mine around... Um, I'm designing my system around Windows. If you want to do Linux, do Linux. I don't care. Uh, you can do Apple if you want to, if you, if you took the Apple server class. Uh, but I won't have any idea what you're talking about because I don't, I don't know anything about Apple servers. So, uh, all I know is they shouldn't make them. But anyway, what do I know? So, first thing we know I'm going to need is a domain controller. Right? That's, that is no doubt the most important thing that you have on a Windows machine. That domain controller is going to contain my Active Directory. It's going to contain my DNS. It's going to contain my uh, group policy editor. Um, and it, and that's, that's all we're going to worry about right now. Okay? Just that. So, we're also going to have some type of file shares. We're going to have print shares. Uh, we're probably going to have web servers. I don't think I needed to make that one word. Uh, we're going to have utility servers. And that's super important. Uh, let's see. Uh, I'm sure we'll have some SQL servers. Um, probably have some test servers. We'll probably have some um, production servers. And I mean, you you could, however you want to design your your your. Uh, however you feel like designing your your network is up to you. What servers and stuff you want. <clears throat> There's, you know, just just know that if you put down what I'm putting down, just because I put it down, that just, uh, you need to explain why you did it. So, um, I'm not going to go in detail on that, because I don't want you guys to just throw up what I just told you. I just want you to be able to understand the concept, okay? So, um, with the domain controller, I... For me, I'm probably going to put it onto my smaller server. And the reason I'm probably going to put it onto my smaller server is simply this one doesn't have as much space and stuff on it. So I'm probably going to use this server kind of as my my brains of the of the network server. So or the network. So I'll probably on on host one um I'm going to include my, uh, let's see, my domain controller. Oh, that's horrible. Let's do it over here. So, host one. It's going to have my domain controller and all those parts that you saw in there. And then I'm also going to do um, a uti my utility servers here. And that's... For right now, that's all I'm going to put on host one. Okay. Now, um, host two... It's going to be everything else.
So I file shares. Print shares. Web servers. <coughs> SQL servers. Test servers. And production servers. Okay. <clears throat> so now we have our machine specs out. We've kind of gotten an idea of how we want to try to design this so that it makes sense. And an important point here. If you're part of a multi-office company, chances are each office will have its own domain controller. And what they will do is they will tie those domain controllers together and the domain controllers will replicate to each other through your connection to each office. Whether you have a VPN connection, you have a dedicated connection, you're using an SD-WAN, whatever. You're going to be connected. And then when you make a change on the domain controller in your Florida office, the domain controllers in Maine and Iowa also get those changes almost immediately okay that way you're not making double and triple changes on people's uh, stuff and you have redundancy if you're a single office what I would do then is I would put a backup domain controller here okay um, and that backup that backup uh, would would replicate but it would be, um, it wouldn't do anything other than just be a replication at this point. I wouldn't want it to be active. I wouldn't want uh, my machines like pinging to it. Um, it would be my my uh, secondary DNS if something happened to to my first. Okay. So the other thing I forgot that I need. is I need a DHCP. So I'm going to put that, um, and that's not part of the domain controller, by the way. I just I, I just put it up underneath there. And you don't want it on your domain controller. I Well, I guess you can put it anywhere you want. I wouldn't put it there. I like to keep my domain controller just my domain controller. And hopefully everybody remembers DHCP. That's the server that uh, leases out addresses to your um, DHCP uh, IP addresses that you that you gave everybody. So now I've got this mapped out. I know where I'm going to put stuff. Um, <clears throat> so then the next thing I have to decide: Do I need any uh, other, you know, virtual appliances or things like that? So in other words, do I need to have uh, a load balancer. Well, in this situation, I probably don't. I only have two hosts. Um, I'm not uh, really messing with anything that, that would need load balancing at this point. But um, if I were a data center, then for sure I would have load balancers. Uh, if I was a software company that was doing testing, uh, we had a client that used load balancers, then what we would do is we would we would find out what load balancers they use and we would put them onto our machine. We'd emulate them uh, and, and make sure that they work, you know, so that, it, that, that uh, they don't have problems with our software and their equipment. So you have to kind of test for that. All right. Um, the other thing that I would probably... Uh, so I'd probably define utility servers and, and you can, you can, these servers, guys, listen, this is not the only way to do this. Okay. This isn't, this is just how I would do it. But when I talk about utility servers, these are servers that 
are tools to the IT team. These are your tools. So I am going to have a server that is dedicated to Veeam and the different um, uh, software that Veeam comes with. Um, you know, you have Veeam, uh, v, let's see, vSphere um, uh, client, and you have vCenter. Um, and you have, so you have all these, these different things that you need to do. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, that was for VMware, but anyway, so you have a Veeam, you have Veeam stuff. You're going to have, um, VMware, which is not the hypervisor, but the other parts of, uh, the other half of the hypervisor idea, which is what you actually, um, uh, interface with on a daily basis. Okay, so you might have vSphere. Um, um, and then you're gonna have uh, vSphere um, Center, I think it's called. Okay, some of the other utility servers I'm gonna have. I'm gonna have, uh, I'll have a Netrix server. Remember, this is one of the uh, the monitoring tools. I'm going to have a Nessus server. Uh, let's see. I'm going to have, um, uh, let's see. I'm going to have uh, PRTG. My that's the that's the um, live monitoring that we talked about. <clears throat> let's see. What else am I going to put in here? Um, okay, that's probably, oh, and I'm going to do a, I'll do a backup repository here. And, um, okay, you guys will have to excuse me, I'm, I'm not doing this very through my morning off, I went at 8 o'clock this morning to set my sprinkler. And I, I thought I had it dialed in right as the sprinkler had popped off and just completely soaked me. So, it woke me up pretty quick, but it threw my day off. So, in my utility servers, I, I'm i going to break it down. Okay, I'm gonna, and I'm going to say, okay, I've got all of this. So, each of these, the reason I do them separately and make them their own machine is I want to make sure that these products, whether it's Netrix or Nessus um, or whatever it is, they play they play well together, right? These actually function. Um, so I, I don't know if Nessus is going to make um, or going to put out a, a an update that might mess up Netrix. Okay, now you'd say, well, they're two complete different companies. I've done this long enough to tell you there is no rhyme or reason uh, as to why these things happen. Uh, but when we do our troubleshooting, um, I'm going to give you a, a case study that happened to me, actually happened to me, and it took us uh, almost a month to figure out what was going on and when we found out what it was, all of us were stunned, including my boss who had 20 plus years experience uh, in the business. <laughs> okay. All right. So we've got our utility servers uh, listed. You might have different ones than I do, and that is just fine. Okay. Now, as far as file shares and print shares go, um, on a file share server, you're just going to create a file share server, and then on that server, you're going to create some kind of a, uh, a file system. In Windows, I would do an NTFS system, and the NTF NTFS system would be all permission-based, and it would be permission-based uh, with the security formed by my security groups in Active Directory. Okay, so if any of you haven't taken uh, the server class yet for, for Windows, um, you should take it. We talk about that. We go through it. It's important to understand. 
chances are you're going to work in a network that at minimum has Windows servers running it. Okay, as far as most of the time people will run Windows version uh, just for domain control or Active Directory DNS because it's so much easier to use than some of the other things that are out there. Uh, but you'll also have Linux machines on your on your system, and and that's okay too. That's that's great because Linux has some wonderful products. They have a very small footprint. No big deal. Okay. So now I kind of know what's on my hosts, and the reason I only did these over here is I want this machine. I want to reserve this machine for anything that I might need as as an IT person. Okay. Then host two, because it's the bigger machine, this is where I'm going to point and install most of my just everyday servers. Because the, here's the beauty of um, here's the beauty of, of virtualization, and that is that I can come up with a standard, and that's something I want you guys to kind of think about, and I'll I'll give you some guidelines. The way this works is for the you're going to create server templates. Now a template is exactly what you think it is. It is just a it's 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 a shell of like uh, uh, like specs. Okay, it it every server template. Um, or each server template is going to be the same as um, one that is similar to it. So I might have server templates, and I might have them for SQL. I might have them for um, uh, I don't know. Let's see. Uh, web servers would be one. Man, I promise I'm not drunk. Um, let's see. So those would oh, uh, that's good enough right now. Those those would be my server templates, and then I would just have a standard template. Um, and then besides this, I would uh, chances are I would select um, I would do like server. 2016 server 2019 and I even might do some Linux dispos okay depending on 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 what our needs were right so the server 2016 is where I would do like that's where I would install my most important stuff and the reason I'm doing 2016 is 2019, it's being used, but not as a, as a complete network yet, unless somebody just started a new network. So, but you could do it any way you wanted to. You could make everything server 2019 and Linux dispose, server 2016, whatever you want. I don't care. Um, so... But you want to create a template. You want to create a template for a SQL. And then you want to create a template for a word for your web servers. And then a standard template. And what I mean by these things is this. You don't want to have to go from scratch every time you try to set up a server. You want to be able to go to your template, spin it up, and then you know that every SQL server is set up exactly the same way. We've we've made the logs, we've, uh, we've truncated the logs so that they don't jam up and take a whole bunch of our space. Uh, web servers, we've made sure that we've enabled IIS and we've set the security features the way that we want it. We've also put on any um, uh, SSL certificates that we need. All the things that you would need on a web server, we want there. That way, every machine that we spin up in one of these categories will be the same. We have uniformity. And that is a key to
to managing a network is having as much uniformity as you possibly can. And I mean uniformity down to everything. Everything. Templates, uh, hardware that you buy, the software versions that you use, even headsets that people use, and office chairs that people use, and keyboards and mice that in and amounts that you guys give out, and everything. Monitors. <laughs> the reason is this. You don't want all of your people making special requests. You will spend all of your time trying to track all this crap down, and then you have you know 500 different you know pieces of hardware. So when something breaks, you're not sure why it broke. But if you have the same laptops, even if it's like a newer version of the same laptop, you know what the weaknesses are. Just a perfect example, really quick. We were using XPS, uh, the 9500 series, and we started having the batteries swell. And the batteries would swell so much that it would push the um, mouse pad up out of the chassis of the of the computer and so we we brought it to Dell's attention and then Dell sent us batteries and we replaced them all but th now we knew that that was happening so we could be proactive when Dell finally came out with their oh yeah these are bad go to this website put in your um your service tag and we'll see if it needs a new battery so we knew exactly what we needed to do so it didn't take us any time at all to get it fixed and then it also takes the guessing game out of who likes what kind of keyboard who doesn't we have this a standard keyboard a mouse we have a standard headset and when somebody onboards we issue all that stuff to them we don't give them a big choice we just say okay here it is here's your monitors and we and in, in the IT department we would use the same thing so standardization uniformity those are your friends okay so now we know what kind of the, the servers that we're going to use and we also know the server templates we're going to create now over here we have our hosts one host two uh and we know all of the different things that that we have to design so the last thing you want to do is just come over here and say okay as a guideline, we're going to put for um, image guidelines. Now these these are going to be our base jumping off points to set up people when we get their server spun up and we're ready to go. Okay, so let's say that we're going to give them. 40 gig C drive. We're going to give them uh, four gigs of RAM. And we're going to give them two virtual cores. Okay. These are our image guidelines. <clears throat> now, the 40 gigabytes in storage, that's pretty common. That's about what you're going to need. Uh, they may end up needing more, and that's fine. Uh, like I said, be careful, you can't go back and take it. Uh, we start with 4 gigs of RAM. Sometimes we'll do 2 if it's just a really small server. If they need more, they'll come to you, and then you can take a look at the performance of the server and make a decision. And then the two virtual cores, that's pretty common. Now, if you have something that's um, really core heavy, does a lot of multi-threading, things like that, then maybe you want to change this. Okay? But you can... These, these two... You can always change these two at any time. 
without having any effect to the server other than either improving performance or dialing it down. But remember, once you do this, once you set it up and give it these numbers, it automatically deducts it from these, from the big numbers. Even if they're not using the full thing, it deducts it. Doesn't matter if you make this static or dynamic. Okay? It still has to reserve that number. Because if you set it up as dynamic, it gives it the entire amount all at once. If you set it up as static, it only gives it, it only shows using what it's actually using. But the hypervisor has reserved the balance for them. Because if they need it, you've already said they could have it because you're allowing it to expand dynamically. So be careful with that. Anyway, this is an idea. I, I don't want anybody's diagram coming in like exactly copied like this. This is just for your... This is, gives you ways to think and try to digest it. I want, you, I want to see you be creative. You don't have to have two hosts. You could have four hosts. You could have one host that just does um, uh, different uh, um, Linux dispos. You might uh, decide that you want, uh, instead of uh, having a virtual host and put your file shares there, maybe you want to do um, a SAN, right? And and set that up. So you'd have to research how you're going to do that. Anyway, if you have any questions, email, text, smoke signal, uh, send me a meeting invite, whatever it is you need to do. I'll, I can answer any more questions you might have, but this should be good for now. Uh, good luck. This should be an inter This is going to push you to really think about how you're going to best utilize assets in your company, all right? And so, anyway, hope, I hope the video is good. It's a lot longer than I thought it would be. I apologize for that. I hope I didn't ramble. Anyway, you guys have a great rest of the day, and I will uh, talk to you again on Monday in our Q&A, which I invite everybody to. You do get extra credit, and it does help. Talk to you guys soon. Bye.